You are listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast, where we look to educate and entertain the endurance racing community through discussions with racing professionals and elite age groupers. In today's episode, I speak with Marnie and Corral Sumble. Marnie is a board certified sports dietitian, a coach, 11 time Ironman finisher, and four time Ironman World Championship qualifier. Corral is a former Cat One cyclist, bike mechanic, bike fit specialist, a coach, and seven-time Ironman finisher and two-time Ironman world championship finisher. I hope you enjoy. Marnie, Carell, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Really good. Thank you. So why don't we start off with learning a little bit about your background. So could each of you just walk me through your athletic backgrounds and how you ultimately got into triathlons? Yeah, absolutely. So I got into the sport actually as a mistake I was training for running races. Well, I should say I come from a swimming background. I swam in college and then I went to graduate school and I was really missing competitive sports when I was in grad school. I moved from Kentucky to Florida. And so someone, I had done a few triathlons, like a sprint and an Olympic, just two on a hybrid bike back in Kentucky. And someone suggested that I should train for a marathon. So I was like, oh, great. That sounds like so much fun. I trained for a marathon And I ended up qualifying for the Boston Marathon after my first marathon. And I was like, wow, I guess I'm good at endurance sports. I have no idea what I should do with this now. And so I was like, well, I guess I should just upgrade my bike and buy a tri bike. And I guess I'll do triathlons. And then I just signed up for an Ironman just out of a whim. Um, So it all happened just really fast. And this was all back in 2005. I did my first marathon and 2006. I did my first Ironman. Wow. <laughs> so you fell upon what landed up being a passion of yours. So Karel, how did you get into the sport? I grew up in a cycling family. Uh, I'm uh, from Czech Republic and uh, my dad was a cyclist from a very early age. Uh, since I remember it, I was always wanted to be a bike racer. And uh, you know, I would be riding bikes from early age and uh, cycling was basically all I cared about. And uh, then when I uh, moved to the United States and after some break I started racing bikes again and uh, I met Marnie and she was training for her first Ironman and I just thought it's it just crazy you know it's, <laughs> <laughs> she here she is this uh, you know tiny small girl and she's training for what I mean <laughs> come on <laughs> I didn't think much of it and I you know I never thought that I would be actually uh, doing uh, the sport myself, but, uh, you know, as the time went on and, uh, you know, I was getting a little bit old, older and uh, I had a hard time to keep up uh, uh, with the cycling on the higher level and I decided that uh, I needed a break, I needed uh, some new motivation and uh, that's uh, when I switched to a triathlon. I uh, didn't want to just uh, try like a local sprint, you know, I said if I do this I want to do something bigger something you know uh, like a bigger uh, goal and a hard race so you know I was looking at the half Ironman distance races and uh, picked uh, one in Branson Missouri which uh, it was rated as uh, one of the hardest uh, the previous year and it was really really hilly and uh, it was pretty awesome event and uh, you know I completed that and we actually both did it uh, Marnie and I and I got hooked uh, ever since and uh, I also want to mention that uh, a funny, funny thing about the whole thing is that uh, I actually signed up for my first Ironman before I completed this first half. Because you know how it is with the Ironman, <laughs> you have to sign up a year in advance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Marnie mentioned uh, she has a swimming background, but Karel, you you came from a cycling background, and and you know uh, swimming is super technical and really kind of nuanced. So how was that for you to get from, uh, you know, just starting out and not having that deep swimming background to becoming a competitive triathlete? Yeah, so it's it's a good question. And I'm sure that's, uh, that's the one that uh, a lot of uh, uh, new triathletes as Europeans are, are dealing with, you know, if you don't gra- grow up as a, as a swimmer, you know, you just don't have it and you don't have that uh, proper uh, body position in the water, you don't have the technique. So it's definitely been the biggest hurdle. And, uh, and uh, something that I have to constantly keep working on. And, uh, you know, I thought it, you know, swimming, yeah, I can swim, but I didn't know what, uh, you know, swimming as far as, a, you know, like a, in the race <laughs> or in the pool, what it really meant. Like I, I could swim not to drown, but that was pretty much <laughs> it. 
Yeah, that that sounds familiar. I actually did something sort of like you, Carell, and and not, I wouldn't advise it, but I signed up for my first half Ironman without ever getting into the pool, and I, I <laughs> and and I figured, hey, I, I used to swim when I was in camp. This should be good. And I went to my first swim practice, and it was the biggest eye opening experience for me. And I was like, wow, I may not be able to do this, but of course, over time, you build up and and you get there. But it's it's definitely uh, something not to underestimate, and it definitely takes time. So um, let's talk a little bit about each of your um, uh, you know, biggest uh, race accomplishment or what you're most proud of, and maybe also one of your favorite races. It may be the same thing, but I, I just would be curious if, you know, Marnie, you can start with just talking a little bit about um, something that you hold close in terms of an accomplishment and, and maybe the race highlight or race that you love to go to the most. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that. Um, you know, throughout the past, this is my 11th year as an endurance triathlete. Um, And I've had a lot of accomplishments. I qualified for the Ironman World Championships after my first Ironman by winning the 18 to 24 age group at Ironman Florida back in 2006. And I've raced Kona four times uh, since then. Corell and I actually raced Kona together in 2015. And and all those are really major accomplishments and definitely a dream come true for any triathlete. So I definitely don't take those for granted what I was able to do. But a big part of what keeps me in the sport is just self-improvement, not necessarily qualifying for a world championship or, um, or, or beating times, but really how I'm comparing myself to competition. I really enjoy racing and trying to get the best out of me. So I would say that on top of qualifying for Kona, my biggest accomplishment was just recently at Ironman Austria, which also happens to be my absolute favorite course. I love racing over there in Europe. And I was second in my age group, which was a, a huge accomplishment for me. And to race in an international race and to place on the podium to be second, I was fourth uh, amateur female. And I also had the fastest swim time there. But all things considered, it just I I had some obstacles on race day, obstacles going into the race. So it wasn't like it was just this perfect day, but um, it just turned out to be one of those races that I'm really proud of what my body was able to do. Uh, I ended up going 10.06. I had a few things happen during the race, but I I think maybe I could have broken 10 hours, but I was just really proud of myself what I was able to do that day. Wow. That sounds amazing. Um, Carell, how about yourself? Uh, What would you consider a, up to this point a racing highlight or a favorite race for you? Yeah, so when I uh, started playing with the idea of doing uh, Ironman uh, races, uh, I told Marnie that uh, if I do this, I want to do it in a, you know some nice place, nice setup, uh, destination type of races. I was not really interested into going to some, uh, you know, convenient uh, uh, destination, which uh, assure, you know, uh, fast uh, and uh, flat race. So my first Ironman was Ironman Lake Placid and I absolutely loved that place. And uh, it's a really great setup. And, uh, you know, it was my first experience and I didn't know what to what to really expect. And of course, I went there with uh, with high goals and expectations and uh, and uh, that didn't really happen. But overall, it was still a very, very good race. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed uh, coming back and uh, I will be coming back this year again. And so, you know, as a continental Ironman, the Ironman Lake Placid is uh, it's probably, you know, one of my favorite places. But uh, overall on the scale, uh, I really enjoy the Ironman Austria, like Marnie mentioned. It's uh, it's close to my home and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's always the, the, the fun time of the year when we go there because we can combine racing it and uh, visiting my family and uh, recovering with my mom's cooking. So it's a, it's a, it's a great setup. And, uh, you know, the race, it's... Uh, it's challenging, but uh, at the same time, it's uh, it's fairly fast. So you know, I've had my best uh, results in that race uh, as far as time-wise. But of course, the biggest uh, accomplishment that I'm so grateful for is that uh, I was able to qualify for uh, Ironman World Championship twice, and uh, I basically qualified there in my first full year as a triathlete. And it was in uh, Ironman Wisconsin, which I also enjoy it uh, very much and it was a qualifier for the following year and Marnie already mentioned it was in the 2015 and then uh, I came back to Kona again last year in 2016 and so it's I really don't have a like one particular favorite race I just you know because I I made the decision to do the races in, in these you know good locations you know I really enjoy it. So both of you clearly have had some success, a lot of success, actually, in triathlon racing. And so I've got a question. 
Do you train together? And how do you manage that considering, you know, different strengths, weaknesses? Marnie's a swimmer, you, you have a cycling background. You know, how do you balance that? And how do you work and help each other out from a training perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think what you know, whenever two athletes, whether they're in a couple, you know, a relationship or just friends, um, it can be good because you can push one another, especially if one is stronger in another area and you can hold each other uh, accountable for the workouts. So I think it's just great to have a, a buddy to train with. And we're pretty lucky that we're married and we can do this together. Um, but we can't do everything together just because we're at different fitness levels. Um, swimming is the easiest for us to do together because we can do our own thing. Or, or, or a similar workout, but uh, not have to wait for each other. So we're still in the pool. We can go there together. Biking, we tend to do some biking together. Uh, that has definitely helped me to be able to kind of stay on Corel's wheel or to be pushed by him. So that works, but he also is just at a different level for cycling. So we kind of have to make sure it makes sense for both of us uh, running Clearly, I cannot stay with Corral, so he does his own runs, you know, on his own. Um, but we both support each other, so whenever we can work out together, we we like to. But um, it's just more for performance, so it's a great time for us to be with each other. But seeing that we spend every minute of every day working together, um, it's okay if we go and do our own thing for workouts. If, if I can add to it, what she mentioned, that the support and motivation is so important because, you know, there are the days when you just feel like, uh, I'm not sure if I want to do this workout and, you know, I'll, I'll probably skip it. And she'll say, hey, get up and let's go to the pool, you know, yeah. which uh, can be sometimes frustrating for me, you know, seeing her swimming, uh, uh, leaving me all all the time behind in the pool. But, uh, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> at the same time, she, you know, makes sure that, you know, I... I get up there and I do it, and uh, and uh, vice versa. If she's, you know, I, you know, she's busy with uh, with life and work, and uh, I just have to tell her, like, okay, stop doing what you're doing right now. You know, you've done enough, and let's uh, let's make sure that you get your workout done. So, you know, the support and motivation is really important. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, people always comment on on my discipline of, you know, oh, you work out every morning, you have the this crazy training schedule, you do Ironmans, that kind of stuff. And I, I always attribute it back to my support system. So, you know, I have a wife uh, that, you know, the days where I don't want to get up in the morning, she forces me to and we vice versa. So that, that support network is so critical. Yeah. And Corel and I, we both come from backgrounds with supportive parents that both understood our love for competition and, and sports. So it's kind of something that we would do anyways. I think just an active lifestyle is just who we are. You know, Corel was supported by his dad and his mom and and my parents were extremely supportive. Um, and even when I turned into a triathlete, when they thought all my swimming events were done with and now they're and then they started to go to triathlon events um it's just great to have that support as well and then of course our friends are our athletes as well so it does help to have people who think like you but also that support and and get you why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, trimarni coaching and nutrition uh business that you have and you offer up uh, coaching services nutrition bike fitting camps a whole array of of services so what's your vision and and sort of uh, uh culture of uh dealing with uh, various athletes and things i know different teams have different cultures and and coaches have different philosophies so would you two uh, walk us through that and kind of explain what your vision is? Yeah. When I started the, the business of Try Marnie, it was after many, many years of education, getting my master's, going back, getting my RD. Corel had many years of experience uh, as the general manager of the truck store. Uh, so running a business and helping other individuals and managing those type of responsibilities. And when I started Try Marnie, as a business back in 2012, I had been doing nutrition and coaching, but that's when we started the actual business and had had the uh, rights to our business. But my vision with Trimarni was always to help athletes reach their performance goals, but in the healthiest way possible. So part of our philosophy is just helping our athletes create these healthy habits and so that they can really keep their body in, in a good working condition as they work hard for their performance goals. And I often tell our athletes and, and people who work with me that, yeah, you have to work hard and it's 
going to be difficult at times and you're going to have to change some things, but I really want them to also enjoy the process. So part of Trimarni is just building a community of individuals where it's a safe environment for people. There's no bullying, there's no gossiping, uh, and there's not making anyone feel excluded. All fitness levels and body types and different backgrounds, we really welcome everybody. So I really do see that with the vision and the growth of Trimarni is that we really see it more than just um, having athletes be world champions, but just helping athletes get the most out of their body and keeping them in the best health possible. Right. And and you talk about health and you kind of highlighted at the very beginning saying doing this in a healthy way. And so, you know, nutrition is one of those aspects and one of those areas where people can have a pitfall, whether it's uh, neglecting the nutrition, trying to lose too much weight, focusing too much on weight, those types of things. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of, you know, both daily nutrition, but also uh, sports nutrition uh, during racing and why that needs to be a focus for athletes? Yeah. And I could definitely talk on this for hours and hours. But, um, you know, through Trimarnia, when I work with athletes, I really try to help athletes create a good foundation of healthy eating so that they're getting the nutrients that they need, that they're supporting their energy needs in a smart way, and then learning how to use sports nutrition products properly so that they can reap those benefits on race day so that they can get the most out of their body. And then, of course, we know that through good nutrition habits, good fueling, hydration, the body's going to work optimally. So we can keep the body in good health by using food and sports nutrition products in, in a smart way. Uh, the other great thing about what I get to do is I get to help athletes work through food issues, whether it's disordered eating, whether it's not knowing how to use sports nutrition, whether it's you know learning to create better structure with, with the day-to-day eating. Uh, and so just taking away that guessing, it allows athletes then to create better healthy habits in a quicker amount of time so that they can really make sure that they're getting the most out of their body with their workouts. Uh, besides nutrition, there's probably some other areas where you've seen common mistakes that athletes make. And and one area I would love to get Carell's input on uh, in, in terms of common mistakes is probably, you know, beginners not realizing the importance of bike fitting, but maybe uh, both of you can kind of walk through some common mistakes you see athletes make and, and how you help them address those, uh, including bike fitting, but any other ones as well. It's a good question, and uh, you know, me coming from uh, you know cycling, uh, many many years of cycling industry and and racing bikes, and now you know doing the triathlon, I think I have a great experience and understanding what it takes to you know ride a bike and put it in the in the in the setup of uh, of the triathlon because uh, it it is not like a racing bike, you know, it's a triathlon, it's a sport, and it's still evolving, and so is the the bike fitting, you know, the bike fitting is actually fairly new, but it seems like. Now these days, uh, being a bike fitter is really cool thing to do. But uh, what I see with uh, my experience and working with athletes, uh, it's it's really not the, the fancy tools that you use uh, to uh, to make the fit happen, such as uh, Retool Fit or Guru or uh, Trackers now that new precision uh, type fit. It's not these fancy tools, but it's your experience and understanding and uh, being able to to help athlete uh, to get into the most uh, efficient uh, position on the bike that will help them in the triathlon, not just having the fast bike split. And uh, you know, I've seen this over and over a lot of uh, times, you know, athletes come here to see me, uh, I'll have them with the fit and they've been previously fitted by, you know, other fitters and but these fitters are typically just operators of these fancy equipment and tools. So, you know, one thing that I always uh, make sure and we try to help our athletes, is especially the newbies, you know, Learn the basics, learn how to ride a bike. Don't rely too much on your gadgets because, uh, you know, if you are, when I was a kid, I started riding the bike and there were no gadgets. We didn't even have a cycling computer to measure the speed. But we were just biking and riding the bikes a lot and we'd be picking up a sign. Hey, there's a sprint, let's uh, sprint, you know. So we're basically, you know, changing the rhythm all the time, learning how to really ride a bike and how to feel the terrain, how to manage the terrain and be, be present and, uh, you know, efficient as possible and give your best all the time. But now these days, uh, athlete comes to, to the sport of triathlon and you have all these gadgets available. They buy the power meters, heart rate monitors and uh, all the fancy bikes and they don't even know how to ride the bikes. They don't know the fundamentals. So I would say, you know, as a, uh, you know, the good advice for the, for the new athletes is just kind of 
take a step back and just go for a ride. Learn how to ride a bike. You need to fast master these skills first before you start playing with all the other gadgets, such as these, you know, high-end tools, power meters, heart rate. Yeah, and we do some camps and uh, group and private camps, and it's a great opportunity to work one-on-one with the athlete and really help them learn how to ride their bike better because we do notice that triathletes tend to be a little uh, less experienced on the bike while many are fast and strong, but the cycling skills just aren't up to par. And I speak from experience just because I've been doing this for many years, almost a decade here. I have a Cat One cyclist that I married, so it was kind of by default I was going to be become a really good cyclist. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice uh, luxury to have. That would be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So um, what other what other areas do you see kind of common pitfalls or, or mistakes? And, you know, one one thing I can think of is uh, overtraining or, or um, you know, just ramping up too quickly and then having injury issues. So, you know, anything around that you, you want to speak about in terms of injury prevention or, or how not to kind of overtrain? train or ramp up too quickly. I think that's one of the most important things coaches can do for people is hold them back. But how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, you know, that's a great point. And I love the sport, especially because you, there's so many different races available. And it's it is very addicting to say, Oh, I did a sprint. Oh, Olympic. Oh, I want to do an Ironman. I mean, Corral and I both did it that way. So maybe we're not the best uh, role models in that area. But the thing is that you have to be very patient because Behind the fun of doing a triathlon, there's development, development with fitness, development with skills, learning how to uh, use nutrition better when you're training and racing, and never is life always perfect, so sometimes training consistency is not perfect as well. So you have to be very patient in this journey, and I think a lot of triathletes aren't patient, and they kind of see their season as just training one race at a time. Oh, I'm training for an Ironman. So I'll start my training, you know, 16 weeks out and I'm training for this Ironman. And while you can do that for maybe a running event, the the sport of triathlon is so skill specific and it requires such great resilience. You really need many years of consistent training to, to get the best out of your body and to stay in good health. So that would be my advice is to be patient and focus on the other areas besides just training long or training hard like sleep and mobility and strength training. All those things can really help you become a better athlete. And they're easy because you don't have to train any longer than you already are. What I would add to it is uh, a lot of uh, newer athletes, they look at a triathlon and they see three sports, swim, bike, and run. But we really need to look at it as it's a one sport, swim, bike, run. It's a triathlon. And uh, on the top of that, there are these fundamental uh, things such as that strength training and, you know, really, you know, nailing all the basics with the nutrition and the, the good habits. So we have to work on all these components that makes this uh, sport uh, triathlon great. And... Uh, you know, if we, a lot of athletes, they just kind of, they are, you know, of course, crunched on time and they want to fit in uh, the three basic sessions, which is swim, bike and run. And a lot of times they they, they think that they need to be swimming like a swimmer, uh, bike like a cyclist and run as a runner. While, you know, it's a, it needs to be balanced and we need to make sure that we don't neglect these small things uh, beside these three sports to be successful. So, Martin and Carell, we're we're almost out of time. So, I, I have one final kind of question for you, and it, it's a two parter, really. But um, w- one is, you know, what was the best advice you ever got as athletes that you kind of was the most transformative advice that really helped your careers as athletes? And then, second of all, for you know, beyond the new athlete, but let's talk about the elite athlete. What would be your best advice there, and in, in terms of you know, how do you get to that final step from being you know a very good competitive age group athlete to qualifying for? Co- and, and what would be your advice for that type of athlete? The first thing that comes to mind when I think about, you know, the best advice I've been given is to, to race more often. I think as triathletes, we train so much. And especially if you're doing an Ironman and, and we specialize in coaching endurance athletes. So we know our athletes are focusing on this big race. Uh, I think triathletes forget that 
you need to learn how to race. And so the best advice that I've been given, and actually Corral and I, we, we talk about this all the time, is we just need to race more. We need to be in that environment. We need to make some mistakes in that race environment. We need to deal with the nerves and the anxieties and all the expectations that we put on ourselves. And it really can help you so that when it does come to that big one day, You feel like you've gone through everything. And to also remember that on race day, new things are going to happen all the time. Um, So this year, actually, I am taking a break from the Ironman distance. I did this once before back in 2012 and had one of my fastest racing seasons and have just been able to be very consistent since then. So taking a break from the Ironman for me and racing more often, focusing on the half Ironman distance, I think is going to, to help me for years to come. When I think about it, I cannot really pinpoint one uh, advice, but more like uh, learning from the past, learning from the experience uh, and, uh, you know, some setbacks. And going back to my, uh, you know, young age when I was uh, uh, starting to race the bikes and, uh, you know, especially being in, in, uh, in, in Czech Republic, the cycling was very, very competitive and, and uh, you know, as a you know 12-year-old kid, I would be racing with, uh, you know, 150 other kids in the race. and. It was almost like you are never good enough. There's always somebody better. And even if you have a good race, you know, and you even possibly can you can win the race, but there's still something that you could have done better. So there was always that, uh, you know, kind of like the discipline that you want to be constantly working and uh, on getting better. And that sort of helped me, you know, throughout the years, you know, and then transition to triathlon because I come from the cycling background, which in cycling, you don't really, unless it's a time trial, you don't care how long or what the time for the race is and the races are all sorts of distances but you care about it you know how you compete against your field how you cross the line you know who crossed the line first so that kind of helps me in the triathlon to you know not be just over calculating every step every minute of the race because it seems like it uh, you know a lot of athletes they go to the race and they pace the event they don't race it they just pace the event and so my cycling background uh, really helped me to, you know, be more present and treat it like a race. So take some risks and learn from it. Or, you know, when I feel like, okay, I'm, 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 I'm hurting right now and, you know, I need to make these decisions. Like, should I uh, keep going with it at this pace or should I back off a little bit? And then maybe when I feel better again, I can push it a little bit harder. So there's constant, you know, engagement in the, in the triathlon races. I think that really, really helped me to, you know, to get to, you know, some sort of success on the amateur level that uh, I have done. And uh, that's something that we also try to teach our athletes uh, when we work with them, you know, don't just be, you know, relying on some, you know, metrics plan. Don't be afraid to, you know, be more active participant in this race and, you know, uh, change things up when they don't go as planned. And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, some sports that are so measured by the distance and time, you know, such as you know, swimming, running, you know, people are more stuck on the, you know, paces and, uh, you know, exact outcome. time, the outcome. But, uh, you know, cycling is a great sport that actually teaches you how to manage the terrain, how to dig deep and recover, how to take these risks and uh, how to really race it. So that's kind of been my, uh, you know, advice through or experience through the years of, uh, you know, being endurance athlete. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as advice for an elite athlete, and I think that this advice could apply for anybody, but really talking to your listeners here that do have aspirations to uh, be on the top of their game, whether it's winning their age group, qualifying for Kona or nationals, whatever it is, just getting to that next level. I see a lot of triathletes that they change the winning formula. So they're so eager to get to that next level that they just change what was working before. And we know that sometimes we do need change. You know, it's good to evaluate and try new things, be open minded. But we have to understand, too, that we just keep developing. So sometimes to become an elite athlete, let's say you're you're good, you win your age group often and you want to go to Kona, you know, maybe you don't need to just pile on many more training hours, focus on the small details. And and what I always tell our athletes is learn to train smarter, not harder. So focus on these little things that you can do. And like Corel talked about, maybe using perceived effort a little bit more, learning how to race a little bit better, dial in your nutrition, sleep better. I mean, we can't quit our jobs and 
you know, get rid of everybody in our life just to train a lot more. So we have to do things in a really smart way. And above everything, you have to enjoy the sport because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to be motivated to put in the work. So uh, Corral and I, we both really enjoy the sport, but we're not too obsessive about it. Um, so we are able to kind of flip on and off that training switch. And it also helps us so that we're not in work mode all the time, but also that we're not in training mode all the time. Right. Well, both of you, thank you so much for that advice. That's really solid and <laughs> deep advice. So definitely useful for me and as well as other athletes. So thank you. And, and Marnie and Carell, thank you so much for your time today and, and sharing your race and coaching experiences with us. It really, I think the listeners will find it really interesting and useful. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This was a great interview. Thanks for listening to the Intelligent Racer podcast. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit www.intelligentracer.com. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and please review us on your podcast directory. Join us next time for another edition of the Intelligent Racer.